Warning, Kinda Murdery contains adult themes, explicit language, and descriptions of violence. It is not suitable for anyone, and we recommend you stop listening now. True crime with a dash of the paranormal, the garish, the strange, and the darkly comic. I'm Zevin Odelberg, host of Kinda Murdery, a podcast that's about more than just murder. It's my very own pocket dimension, home to a curated collection of bizarre and compelling stories, the unsolved, the unsettling, and the unbelievable. I cover it all, just so long as it's Kinda Murdery. Like it says in the intro, I am Zevin Odelberg, and this is Kinda Murdery. We have arrived at part three, the thrilling conclusion of Kinda Murdery's investigation into Marjorie Deal Armstrong and the notorious pizza bombing, the story that inspired the Netflix documentary Evil Genius. That's right, I said part three, so if you haven't heard parts one and two yet, go back and listen to them, and then rejoin us. We'll save you a seat. If you're all caught up, then we're ready to rock. Now I know I often rewind the narrative just a bit to let you settle back into the story, I'm going to deviate from tradition and not do that today. I'll just remind you where we left off in episode 2. The jury has just left the courtroom after the conclusion of Marjorie Deal Armstrong's trial to deliberate and decide her fate. So now, if you're ready, please join me as we uncover what truths we can and solve what mysteries we may. Kinda murderies. Some women just want to watch the world burn. Marjorie Deal Armstrong and the Pizza Bomber. Part 3 starts now. When Marjorie Deal Armstrong took the stand, one could almost feel the collective anticipation in the courtroom. The jury watched, their faces etched with skepticism. And the moment she began to speak, it became palpable. Her words weren't convincing them. After Marjorie's performance, the jury sequestered for 11 grueling hours. Not very long, really, for such a high-profile case. They were dissecting every piece of evidence, every testimony. When they re-emerged, the weight of their decision was monumental. They found her guilty on all counts. Armed robbery, conspiracy, and deploying a destructive device during a crime of violence. The words echoed in the courtroom resonating with grim finality. It wasn't just a verdict, it was the sealing of Marjorie's fate. Mandatory life imprisonment loomed before her, an unyielding wall she couldn't scale or bypass. This was no ordinary case. The destructive device, the bomb collar, had not just been an instrument of fear. It had consequences devastating and irreversible. It's worth noting and maybe this is obvious, but it's something that you might not think about when caught up in the narrative of Marjorie Deal Armstrong and the murder of Brian Wells. But explosive devices place everyone at risk, not just the direct victim, police, bystanders, anyone within the bomb's radius, not to mention the victim, the victim's family, friends, people that live in the city, in the neighborhood, even in the state. All of them can potentially face unforeseen and often tragic outcomes. It's similar to the reason why those convicted of arson face more severe penalties than those convicted of murder. Why, you wonder? How is burning down a building worse than murdering someone? Well, you may intend to only burn down a building, but what if that fire you start burns down an entire city? Here, as there, the jury's decision, the penalties for the crime, aren't just a judgment on Marjorie. They're a statement against a particular kind of reckless violence that tears at the very fabric of society. Imagine being in that jury room, grappling with the heavy burden of judgment. The facts were intricate, the stakes colossal. But in the end, the group of 12 men and women tasked with carrying this burden decided that the evidence left no room for doubt. This was not a spur-of-the-moment decision, not the jury's verdict, but the crime committed. It was a calculated act meticulously planned, and coldly executed. As the verdict was read, the courtroom held its breath, then exhaled. The jurors had done their duty, and without compromise. For Marjorie, the courtroom became a stage where the drama of her life reached its tragic climax. As the gavel fell, 
signaling the end of this harrowing legal saga, one couldn't help but reflect on the enormity of what had just transpired. Justice, in its most solemn form, had been served. Or had it? We turn now to a man who doubts that justice was done. Seven years is a long time for questions to fester, for doubts to worm their way into the corners of one's mind. The verdict had answered many questions for the public, and perhaps even for some investigators. But not for Jim Fisher, ex-FBI agent and criminal justice professor at Edinburgh University in Edinburgh, Pennsylvania. Jim believed that serious questions remained. His obsession with the collar bomb heist was more than professional. It was almost as if the case had gripped him, refusing to let go until every puzzle piece snapped into place. Fisher followed the case closely, scrutinized the meaning of every shred of evidence revealed to the public, analyzed every media report. Something didn't sit right with him. The FBI's behavioral analysis had painted a specific picture. This wasn't a straightforward bank heist. This crime was something more sinister, a puzzle designed not to amass cash, but to confound, to bewilder those who would dare to solve it. It was like a dark riddle whispered in the dead of night, aimed more at the minds of investigators than the vault of the bank. Now, Marjorie Deal Armstrong was many things, but a creator of complex enigmatic puzzles? Well, that didn't align with what Fisher knew of her. Her motive was straightforward, secure money to pay a hitman. There was no evidence to suggest she delighted in taunting law enforcement or sending them on a wild goose chase. This gap between the FBI's psychological profile and Marjorie's known objectives was a chasm that Jim Fisher couldn't bridge. Think about it. You're a retired FBI agent who's seen countless crimes, examined the psychological contours of myriad criminals, and yet here is a case that defies categorization, that resists resolution. It's like a book with missing pages, a story with an ending that contradicts its beginning. Jim Fisher's unsatisfied curiosity speaks to something deeper, an elemental aspect of human nature. It's not just about solving a case. It's about understanding the motives, the dark underbelly that propels people into committing such heinous acts. And until that gap is bridged, until that chasm is filled with a mortar of understanding, the case, for Fisher at least, remained an unsettling enigma. The verdict had closed a chapter, but for Jim Fisher, the book was far from over. It still beckoned with unanswered questions, compelling him to search for that final piece that would make the puzzle complete, render it fully understood. Until he found that piece, the pizza bomber case would remain in the back of his mind, an unsolved mystery within a solved one. Fisher believed the spotlight should have been shifted from Marjorie to Bill Rothstein, her neighbor, a man who, while under no cloud of suspicion, of his own volition, freely confessed to something pretty disturbing, storing a human corpse, and not just a corpse but a murder victim, in his freezer. If that wasn't unsettling enough, Rothstein also perfectly fit the FBI's behavioral analysis of the bomb maker. The description was uncanny. Someone, quote, comfortable around a wide variety of power tools, frugal yet creative. Rothstein wasn't just a person of interest. He was, in Fisher's eyes, the missing piece. The elusive mastermind who could tie the entire mystery together. Here was a man who had demonstrated a certain comfort with death, whose workshop was filled with tools that could construct not just machinery, but also chaos. Think about the enormity of such a revelation. After years of focusing on Marjorie, the real architect could be someone else. Someone who had almost been hiding in plain sight, lurking in the shadow of another suspect. In the high-stakes chessboard of the investigation into the pizza bombing, Rothstein had presented himself as a pawn, but Fisher saw him as the player, not a piece. Rothstein was the puppeteer, manipulating the strings, not a marionette dancing to someone else's tune. If Fisher's hypothesis is correct, it reframes the entire narrative, turning it into a tale not just of criminal intent, but of manipulation and cunning. The implication would be staggering. Rothstein, hiding behind the facade of a neighbor, could be the one who orchestrated the entire intricate ballet of crime and deception. And, if Rothstein was indeed the puppeteer, then the full complexity of this disturbing narrative has yet to be revealed. Fisher didn't see Deal Armstrong's conviction as the end of the road. Instead, it was a dark and uncertain detour, leading deeper into the tangled woods of a case that refused to be easily 
understandably, satisfactorily, solved. Rothstein had manipulated the entire case, Fisher argued. He crafted the scavenger hunt as a means to mislead investigators and waste their time, just as Brian Wells had wasted his final moments following fruitless clues. Rothstein's early involvement in the case, including the 911 call that implicated Marjorie in a different crime, set the stage for the entire investigation to unfold on his terms. Rothstein voluntarily meeting with authorities created the illusion of a man with nothing to hide. Even on his deathbed, Rothstein maintained his innocence regarding the collar bomb, still controlling the narrative, even when he seemingly had nothing left to lose. Fisher's assertion sums it up, quote, he died with all the secrets. He died taking all the answers with him. Rothstein, in Fisher's estimation, was the Moriarty, the ultimate mastermind, scripting the story to the very end. He evaded legal retribution, sidestepped detection, and left the world grappling with a cadre of what Fisher referred to as idiots. Marjorie Deal Armstrong and her ragtag band of mechanicals were individuals who were part of the narrative but had little understanding of the full scope of the events, the cause and effect, that Rothstein had set into motion. His was the evil genius that flicked the first domino over and then watched the rest of them inevitably fall according to his plan. Consequently, Fisher believes that the story of Marjorie Deal Armstrong and the Pizza Bomber was left riddled with lingering questions, a cryptic puzzle with missing pieces, forever obscuring the complete picture. Bill Rothstein took it all to the grave, leaving investigators wrestling with a Gordian knot that might never fully unravel. In this way, Bill Rothstein secured the final word, crafting an unsolved mystery that continued to perplex and confound. He orchestrated his own exit, evading capture in life and remaining mysterious in death. That, according to Fisher, was Rothstein's ultimate victory. He got the last laugh, while everyone else was left asking the unanswered questions. Marjorie passed away in a Texas prison. Brian Wells lost his life in that fateful parking lot. The only person who might hold further answers is ex-TV repairman and crack dealer Kenneth Barnes, whose sentence was reduced from 45 years to 20 years due to his cooperation. He's expected to be released in 2027, making him the last surviving individual connected to this confounding case. So, was Bill Rothstein, who seems to have died of natural causes, and this is a bizarre way to describe it, but at a convenient time, was Bill Rothstein the real mastermind behind the pizza bombing case? As we've now learned, ex-FBI agent Jim Fisher certainly thinks so, but others, who were intimately familiar with the case, disagree. We turn now to Leonard Ambrose and Doug Sugru. <laughs> Within the intricate web of crime and intrigue surrounding the Pizza Bomber case, Leonard Ambrose and Doug Sugru stand as key figures. These two defense attorneys had a front row seat to the saga of Marjorie Deal Armstrong. Ambrose and Sugru represented Deal Armstrong at different critical junctures of her life steeped in violence and chaos. Ambrose took the helm in her first homicide trial, a taut legal drama that played out in Erie County Court back in 1989. Deal Armstrong, proclaiming self-defense, was acquitted for the killing of her boyfriend, Bob Thomas. He was shot six times while lounging on a couch in their home, a home that was overflowing with hoarded food and a palpable air of dysfunction. Years later, Sugru would be appointed to represent her in the trial that became her legal finale, the one we've just been covering, the federal case in Erie related to the pizza bomb plot. Now, as we know, Deal Armstrong was convicted for her role in the tragic demise of Brian Wells, and sentenced in 2011 to life plus 30 years. We should probably mention one more time, only because it's easy to get sidetracked in a life as full of chaos and violence as Deal Armstrong's was, and yet it's important to remember that a human life is never a detail to be forgotten, that Marjorie also allegedly murdered a third man, boyfriend James Roden another man from her romantic past who ended up as a frozen corpse in Bill Rothstein's garage freezer, part and parcel of this grim narrative. So both of these attorneys, Ambrose and Sugru, lived through the experience of representing the complex and troubling individual that was Marjorie Deal Armstrong. 
As such, they are the custodians of first-hand insights into a woman linked to multiple deaths in a string of nefarious activities, into both her actions and her psychology. Ambrose and Sugru are not mere footnotes in this dark chapter of crime. Their experiences form a crucial layer of understanding when it comes to grasping the complex mystery that was Marjorie Deal Armstrong. They bear witness to a life filled with unsettling questions, leaving us to ponder what might have been if her mental illness had been adequately addressed and she had been confined within institutional walls. While Deal Armstrong herself met her end in 2017, succumbing to breast cancer in a Texas federal prison at the age of 68, her legacy persists. Her story has been chronicled in various mediums, including this podcast. And we know that ex-FBI agent and criminal justice professor at Edinburgh University, Jim Fisher, has persistent questions about what really occurred in the Pizza Bomber case. But for Ambrose, there's an entirely different unsettling what-if that haunts the narrative. Leonard Ambrose has remained resolute in his conviction that Deal Armstrong should never have faced a judge and jury. Four decades after he secured her acquittal in the Thomas case, he remains steadfast in his belief that she should have been placed in a mental institution rather than facing criminal trial. She never should have been tried, he insists. Now, he may be jumping to conclusions, but frankly, they're the logical conclusions. According to Ambrose, had Deal Armstrong been institutionalized, a number of things would not have transpired. There would have been no pizza bomber case, no trial, no one in a refrigerator, he said. Ambrose sees Deal Armstrong's commission of additional violence as an inescapable outcome, a fate that could have been averted if proper measures were taken. Quoting Ambrose again here, it was inevitable that once she was acquitted, she would have been involved in something of a similar nature. It was inevitable. To Ambrose, institutionalizing Deal Armstrong would not only have been better for her, but could have spared the lives of two or three other individuals. Ambrose points out that Deal Armstrong was aware of her bipolar condition and openly acknowledged it. During the Thomas trial, he and Deal Armstrong wove a complex defense narrative. They focused on claims of self-offense, allegations of abuse, and a spiraling relationship riddled with mutual mental health struggles. In that trial, Deal Armstrong's testimony threw light on a chaotic mental state. You really get to the point where you're burned out, she articulated, detailing why she had fired six lethal shots into her boyfriend's chest. As we've discussed previously, her household shared with Thomas became part of Erie's dark mythology. Inside their Sunset Boulevard residence, they stored rotting government surplus food, butter, cheese, and more, collected from various food pantries across the city. This hoarding wasn't just bizarre. It was a manifest symptom of their dysfunctional lives and shattered mental health. Ambrose himself was more than just a spectator to Deal Armstrong's mental health struggles. He was often directly in the line of her erratic behavior. Frequently, she would call him from prison, at all hours, leaving him tethered to a phone line. Her bipolar disorder included symptoms like pressured speech, leading her to engage in extensive, often rambling monologues. These conversations were so prolonged, Ambrose admitted that with Marjorie tying up the line, he, quote, had no phone service, sometimes all night. What emerges is a portrait of an individual severely impacted by mental illness. Ambrose, having been close to the whirlwind that was Deal Armstrong, can't shake off the belief that her place wasn't in a courtroom, but rather in a mental institution. For him, that might have changed the entire trajectory, not just of her life, but of everyone caught in her orbit. We know that Marjorie Deal Armstrong was a woman of contradictions. She claimed high intelligence without hesitation, and that claim was backed by her academic record, straight A's from Academy High School, where she ranked 12th among 413 classmates in 1967. Yet despite frequently bragging about her high intellect, she vehemently denied being the evil genius or scheming brain behind the notorious pizza bomber plot. Seemingly unaware that claiming to be a genius, just not this particular genius, may not have helped her case. Ambrose found her to be a glaring testament to the coexistence of intelligence and mental instability. He said, Intelligence has nothing to do with delusional beliefs making the point that one's intellectual capacity doesn't immunize them from the debilitating impact of mental disorders. In November 2007, 
five months post-indictment in the Pizza Bomber case, Marjorie Deal Armstrong made a resounding declaration over the phone from prison. I am 1,000% innocent, she stated forcefully. This wasn't a casual call to a friend. It was a public claim made to the Erie Times News. Her plea was born out of desperation. I'm trying to get extricated from this maze. I'm trying to see daylight. My time is running out here, she expressed. At the time, she was striving to remove her then-lawyer, Thomas Patton, from her legal defense. Patton, a federal public defender highly regarded in Erie, was eventually dismissed, making room for Doug Sugru. U.S. District Judge Sean J. McLaughlin issued a stern warning to Deal Armstrong. If she found herself dissatisfied with Sugru, she'd have no other option but to represent herself. While Deal Armstrong was known for her volatile temperament, she didn't attempt to oust Sugru who maintained a calm demeanor throughout the case. Sugru, reflecting on his time with Deal Armstrong, remembered their extended conversations about her past, conversations that painted a picture of a promising young woman. She was a smart teenager, impeccably dressed, on a track for both academic and professional success. According to Sugru, even in her most tumultuous moments characterized by pressured speech and manic behavior, Deal Armstrong could still be guided to recall a time when her life seemed full of potential. She would focus on her exemplary grades and various secretarial roles she had assumed around Erie. It was a brief respite, a glimpse into what might have been amid a life overtaken by mental health struggles and criminal notoriety. We've already heard how the death of Deal Armstrong's mother had a debilitating impact on her mental health, leaving her completely unmoored. She said at the time, my mother was a clean living woman. I loved my mother. I might have had differences with her, but she was all that I had. Sugru speculates on the impact of this loss, saying, quote, If her mother could have lived longer, I think that would have helped. The absence of a maternal anchor seemed to accelerate Deal Armstrong's descent into a reality dominated by mental health struggles and violence. Three years after the death of her mother, on August 28, 2003, Deal Armstrong's name would become inextricably tied, synonymous with the notorious pizza bomber. The violent end of Brian Wells signaled that the chaos in Deal Armstrong's life had escalated beyond any point of redemption. To be fair, to the millions of nonviolent people who struggle with mental health issues and even bipolar disorder or narcissism, Deal Armstrong's involvement in both the murder of Bob Thomas and the death of Wells cannot wholly be explained away by her mental instability. As we've already heard her former attorney Leonard Ambrose opine, she was a menace to society who ought to have been committed to an institution. But as we now know, the judicial system had a different outcome in store for her. She was ultimately sentenced to life plus 30 years in prison, a terminal verdict. And as we heard at the very top of this story, at the beginning of episode one, one federal magistrate judge, in rejecting one of Deal Armstrong's many appeals, labeled her as a, quote, coldly calculated criminal recidivist and serial killer. In case you're not sure what recidivist means, I had to look it up myself. It means repeat offender. The federal magistrate's assessment of Deal Armstrong's character coincides with those given by both of her defense attorneys, Leonard Ambrose and Doug Sugru. Each man was professionally obligated to delve into her chaotic and apparently malevolent mind, and they emerged with a shared assessment. Deal Armstrong was a woman whose potential brilliance and possible place as a productive member of society was overwhelmed by a life disordered by mental illness and violence triggered by loneliness leading her down a dark path filled with destruction, murder, and incarceration. As her attorney Leonard Ambrose soberly summarized, it's just a sad epitaph. It really is. I'm Zevin Odelberg, and this has been Kinda Murdery. <laughs> <laughs>